All right, then. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this webinar on flash chromatography and PrEP HPLC systems for organic compounds purification. Um, my name is uh, Vince. I'm part of the exports team at Separations. I would like to start. Uh, I'd like to start the webinar with a brief introduction to Separations. At which point, I'll hand over to our guest speaker, Mr. Philip Moss at Teledyne Esco. Separations was founded by Mr. Paul Quiser in 1989. Our head office is based in Johannesburg, SA. We have six sales divisions, each focused on a specific set of workflows and techniques. We also have a very capable service department and dedicated application support team. The oldest division at Separations is our Chrome Techniques division. As the name implies, the focus here is on chromatic graphic techniques like sample prep, TLC, flash chromatography, HPLC, and GC. Our water techniques division is focused on water analysis, microbiology, and spectroscopy. Techniques supported here include filtration, discrete analysis, photometric water analysis, environmental QC, membrane filtration, atomic absorption, and ICP. The biotechniques division offers products and solutions for molecular biology, cell and tissue culture, and protein biochemistry. Techniques cover uh, our DNA, RNA extraction and purification, PCR, molecular diagnostics, and sequencing. Biofarm Techniques is a specialized division offering products and expertise to clients doing pharmaceutical production, biotherapeutics and vaccines production. Key suppliers include Paul, Applicon, and GE Healthcare or Sativa for filtration technology, bioreactors, and cell culture media and sera. The robotics division is focused on lab automation and equipment, mass spectrometry, spectroscopy, microscopy, and cellular imaging. Key suppliers include Hamilton, Sykes, Leica, molecular de devices, Teledyne Isco, Teledyne Lehman Labs, Evoqua, Radley's, Hardolf, and Neuve. Uh, thank you for, this, uh, for your attention. At this point, I'd like to hand over to our guest speaker, Mr. Philip Moss at Teledyne Isco. Philip, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Vince. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, firstly, I hope you can hear me OK. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Well, Philip. that's good. That's a good start. Uh, <laughs> the next thing I'm going to do is see if I can share my screen. Yeah. Which, if I can find the right presentation, that one. Can, you, can everybody see that okay? Can you see that? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you today. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, a bit Philip, of background Jim, noise there. Uh, yeah, my, my name's Philip Moss, as uh, Vince has said. Uh, I'm, uh, I work for Teledyne Isco, uh, which is actually a US company. You, you can probably hear from my accent, I'm actually British. Uh, I'm based in the UK, so I'm a, kind of in a similar time zone to you guys. Uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give is, uh, is really just an overview of some of the automation and purification options that are now available. Uh, just to give an overview of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the company Teledyne Isco um, and then move on to chromatography with a bit of background on on uh, flash chromatography in particular and TLC uh, then talk about some of the benefits of automating the uh, flash chromatography in particular um, then move on to our uh, flash chromatography products uh, just give a, some, an overview of the sort of features and, and what's available now and how things have progressed. Uh, and then talk about flash and prep HPLC and how they both have a place in purification. And then finish off at, just with a little introduction on the preparative HPLC systems that are now available. Um, Sorry, Philip, I, can I interrupt you for a second? 
Yes, of course. Um, we seeing your screen still in a PowerPoint and not the presentation mode. OK, so what do I need to do? Just click on the little uh, present button at the bottom. OK. Hang on a second. There we go. Is that dis under display settings? Sorry to uh, just go to slideshow. Yeah, which is where in at the top. Okay. I've got display settings, which you don't want. Could be that you're sharing a different screen to what you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, just one second. Right. So something called slideshow mode you mentioned. I'm not familiar with this uh, with well, Teams, unfortunately. So, if if you're within PowerPoint, um, you okay. can just activate the slideshow. Which I think I have. Where about yeah, I'm in PowerPoint now. Sorry. So Philip, if you click you on just, uh, Philip, you can just hit F5. OK. Does that did that do anything? Not on my side. Maybe if you click on from current slide, which has it. Um, sorry. I'm going to try and, um, I don't know whether it's because I've got two screens or something. I don't know, but I've got it. I've got it. Yes. Um, Just one second. How's that? Does that do anything? Uh, no. <laughs> Philip, are you able to maximize the screen? It, well, the thing is, it is maximized my end. You see, that's it, I, it's oh, maximized. Okay. That's the thing. It's. Perhaps stop sharing and, and re -share. Yeah. How's that? No. Better? No, nothing's changed on my side. Yeah, I'm not, Same. I'm, I've switched off the screen, the other screen's off, and now I'm on I'm not sharing. Can you not see the presentation at all? We see it in, in PowerPoint and not the actual slides, sir. Yeah, well. Have you pressed F5? Yeah. Stress. How's that? Uh, that's it, perfect. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, right, sorry about that. Uh, OK, so you can see now, so yeah, basically, we'll finish off with a co uh, comparison of Flash and Preparative HPLC. Um, as I've mentioned, we're a US company. Uh, the company is based in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is in the center of the US. Uh, we now have a second site, uh, uh, which is in the um, basically to the east in Pennsylvania. That's uh, actually our pump manufacturer. Uh, we basically have two divisions. There is a water instrumentation division 
and a laboratory and process instrumentation division. Um, uh, this presentation and uh, at this interest here is really for the laboratory and process instrumentation and, and focusing on the liquid chromatography products. Uh, the company was founded in 1961. Um, there's a picture you can see there of the founder of the company, that's Bob Allington. Um, you may spot he's actually sitting in a wheelchair. Basically, he was one of the last people in the US to get polio, unfortunately, which meant that nobody would employ him at the time. So he found it. He was an engineer, so he founded the company. Um, and over those years, uh, Isco was one of the first manufacturers of fraction collectors. Um, and you can see that's an early fraction collector he's sitting next to. Um, Later on, he developed the first XY format fraction collectors. Um, ISCO was involved in HPLC since the 1980s and invented a number of products, uh, including uh, things like low pressure mixing. That was a patent that was developed as a process and patent that was developed by ISCO. Um, the company's been around for over 50 years. Uh, we first got into flash chromatography in 1997. We were acquired by Teledyne, Isco, by Teledyne in 2004. Teledyne is a sort of holding company that uh, owns a number of companies, probably about 70 or 80 now, in, and these are involved in electronics, defence, aviation, uh, labor and laboratory business, in which there are a number of other laboratory-based companies. Uh, moving on to why we're here, which is the purification products. We have um, the, just pictured there the products that we currently have on offer, which we'll be talking about later. That's the preparative HPLC system, the AccuPrep, uh, the EasyPrep, which is a hybrid system, and then the, the Flash system, which is the next gen which is the one on the right hand side. We also have a, a larger scale purification system. Um, this is for really uh, grams to hundreds of, hundreds of grams. It's a, the, the, this is called the torrent. You see it there. Um, the largest actual separation column, which is the one on the right hand side, is uh, a three kilogram column. Uh, so that you know, really allows you to purify really grams up to maybe three or four hundred grams of material depending on the difficulty of the purification. Just a quick mention of other products we have. We have uh, fraction collectors. Uh, that's the Foxes that you can see on the left there. We do preparative HPLC columns and we've got some flash columns as well shown. These are pre-packed uh, flash columns packed with a variety of different media. Um, the other side of the laboratory business is actually more involved on uh, delivery of chemicals. These are specialist pumps that we offer for, which are used in the synthesis process, uh, flow chemistry, um, or adding reagents. Uh, these are high pressure, very precise pumps. And what, what you see there is a syringe pump system and also some reciprocating type pumps, similar to what is used in HPLC. So moving on to, I guess, the main reason we're here, which is chromatography. We have uh, basically I'm going to talk a little bit here about the background to flash chromatography and, and a little bit about thin layer chromatography. So just just stepping back a second and just looking at the principles, uh, chromatography is a separation technique for uh, purifying mixtures. Uh, and basically it's liquid chromatography so the mixture that you're trying to purify is typically pure dissolved in a solvent or a mobile phase and, it, and that is then pump, pumped or delivered through a stationary phase um, the the different polarities of this sort of mobile and stationary phase are what cause the sort of separation to take place uh, the, the uh, constituents or the compounds you're interested in interact differently with the mobile and the stationary phase. Uh, so that's that's the sort of principle and there's basically two different types, normal phase and reverse phase. Normal phase is where the silica is polar and the solvent is typically non-polar. Reverse phase is 
where there's it's still usually a silica media, but the silica will be shielded in some way with some hydrophobic material like C18, and then you're using um, uh, more polar solvents. So it's kind of it's the interaction between the two that drives the chromatography. Um, liquid chromatography comes in different forms. Uh, thin layer chromatography is tends to be used to identify what's happening uh, or to help you understand a method or, or see if peaks are separated or compounds. Flash chromatography and HPLC are typically used to purify material or for analytical work. And then there's uh, other kind, more recent developments in analytical HPLC, which would be uh, UHPLC or UPLC. And these are, this is sort of high resolution HPLC at very high pressures, but not really applicable to purification, but more for in terms of the analysis to support it. Um, just showing a picture here of flash chromatography, how traditionally and historically it would be performed. This is uh, sort of columns that somebody's packed, which they're adding uh, sample or solvent into the top of to manually perform the purification. Uh, when would uh, chromatography be used in the, the sort of purification arena? Typically, there's two types of applications. One is related to uh, synthetic chemistry. Uh, the other would be related to natural products. With synthetic chemistry, in some ways, it's hopefully easier because you know what you're trying to make. Um, so you know what you're looking for and hopefully you would have some idea of the chromatography that would be needed to, to perform the separations and purifications. Uh, with natural products, uh, it can be more difficult because you're taking plant materials which are complex, extracting the elements or the analytes and then looking sometimes for unknown products, maybe biologically active products. Um, and when you start, you might not have any idea of the chromatography that you need to achieve those purifications. So just looking at the traditional uh, method of uh, glass chrome column flash chromatography, which is still used a lot. Uh, typically, you would uh, mix the solvents by hand to make it the, the mixture that you need to perform your separation. You would uh, pack a column with loose silica column is typically a glass tube and pour, you know, pour the sample in, it's sort of wet packed. Uh, sometimes you use air to, to, to pack the column or push compress the uh, silica to help with the packing. You then load the sample at the top and then add the solvent and then you basically manually collect fractions as the, as the uh, solvent comes through the column bringing through the uh, se hopefully separated uh, components that you're interested in. Uh, and then at the end of the process, you typically have to TLC the fractions to try to identify which, if you've separated the compounds of interest um, and which fractions contain which compounds. As I've mentioned previously, there's different types of uh, chromatography. We've got normal phase chromatography where we, uh, and this is mainly the one that's used in flash chromatography. Uh, it uses um, silica, typically 50, 60 micron irregular silica uh, particles, which, you, which are polar, and then you introduce the sample usually in a non-polar solvent and then play around with the polarity of the solvent to to get the separation. Um, there are different types of silica that are modified in some way, which are still still fairly non fairly polar. <coughs> but then moving down the screen, you've got uh, diol and C18, which are sort of more non polar silica. So this is what's normal phase chromatography. Reverse phase chromatography, as I mentioned, is the reverse of normal phase. This is where you have you're still using silica, but you've coated the silica with a uh, non-polar hydrophobic sort of uh, coating like C18 or C8, and then you're using you're using uh, more polar solvents to uh, 
to do the elution or carry your sample through the column. As previously mentioned, uh, thin layer chromatography is used a lot in this process. Uh, thin layer chromatography is, is a useful way to quickly separate your mixtures or identify what's there. Um, TLC is not used for the purification, but it's used to support or identify what's going on. So you with TLC, you've got your silica on a glass plate or, or you've got alumina. You would uh, basically load, put your uh, silica, sorry, your plate into a in some solvent, having sp spotted some sample onto it. And then you watch the, the solvent elute up the plate carrying your sample and it, it's the interaction between the sample and the plate that causes these spots to separate hopefully. So at the end of that what you've what you've hopefully got after you've seen on the pick left hand picture you've spotted your samples on the left hand side on the right hand side you have uh, your uh, hopefully separated compound with the spots have moved up the plate. Um, t TLC can his be translated into into a method for flash chromatography, um, and basically this is because the of the movement of the, the relative movement of your sample spots compared with the solvent. In normal phase, the spots move up the faster up the the less polar spots move faster, um, and the, the more polar spots move slower. With glass columns, this, you've got the same elution taking place. Uh, so, so basically, the, the principle of how the chromatography is working is the same on the flat plate as it is in the glass column. Uh, how do we get from TLC to column co a method for column chromatography? Basically, what this this movement or relative movement of the spots is is called a retention factor, and basically, you the retention factor of the spots that you can calculate. It's a retention factor relative to the solvent movement. You can correlate that in, into column volumes. It's basically an inverse correlation. So once you know the RF values, you can work out how many column volumes are needed to move the sample through the system. A lot of disadvantages of glass chromatography. Uh, the first one is it's very time consuming. Uh, it's only isocratic uh, so that means you typically only use one mixture of solvent so you take the mixture that is the best chance of separation and and that's what you have to use all the way through the the process it's a manual process you have to then you've no idea when you've collected fractions where where your compound is going to be so you have to do a lot of tlc work and because you're working in this manual process there's a lot of handling going on you're handling silica which is not very nice you can be breathing the solvents and then actually work it pouring solvents into quite tall columns it's not easy especially if it's dichloromethane which is very heavy so a number of years ago there was a big push on from the industry to try to automate the flash chromatography process um, an automated system really consists of solvent reservoirs. We're then using a pump to uh, or a, to basically pump the solvents through the column. Because we have a pump, we can now use some kind of gradient formation to mix solvents or change the mixture of the solvents during a run. We've got, we have to have some way to introduce the sample, which could be liquid or, or could be solid or a, some kind of suspension. Uh, then we have a separation column and we have a uh, we have a, a, a detector basically and the detector is hopefully can be used to reduce the number of samples that we need to look at or the number of fractions the detector can also control a fraction collector so you basically collect fewer fractions potentially and so have lost much less work to do after the separation So trying to look at some of the benefits of automation flash chromatography. Um, in the early days, they made a, a kind of little experiment, uh, just trying to separate these two amide compounds, which have different RF values here, these RF of 0.18 and an RF of 0.10. Um, 
when you try to separate these, this is just showing an attempt at separation in 30% ethyl acetate and hep heptane. So what, what uh, we did was to simulate an open column purification by using a, actually an automated system, but in but pumping the solvent mixture constantly. So just pumping an isocratic mixture of solvent. So on the left hand side here, you've got uh, this is using a 12 gram column. So the, and the goal was to try to purify these compounds 100 percent. So when we used on the left hand side, 30 percent ethyl acetate in heptane, um, we've got uh, a number of a number of fractions here uh, that have been collected over the run. So we've actually connected uh, ten fractions, but uh, as you can see, some of them are not pure. The second run, the second run here was using a different solvent mixture of 25% ethyl acetate with heptane. So this time we've collected 11 fractions, uh, but we have um, only one of them. Uh, so there's one impure one, but there's five pure fractions of A and B. Um, the third separation was going to 20% ethyl acetate, where we've achieved a complete separation of the of the pure A compound and the B compound. But to do that, we've had to collect 22 fractions. So that that's kind of the best you could do in a sort of classical sort of manual flash process. So then we've taken the same process again and shown it with a step gradient where instead of using a constant mixture of solvent, we have changed the solvent over time, but in steps. And in this particular instance on the left hand side, we have uh, basically uh, collected six fractions of A and six fractions of B. We've achieved uh, some purification, but there are actually 15 fractions there. Um, but on the right hand side, we've done a, this is showing a linear optimal grade, sorry, optimized gradient. So you're doing a separation from 10% to 30% uh, eth sorry, ethyl acetate in heptane. We've got, we've produced 16 fractions doing that, um, but, but have achieved uh, some pure, it can basically 14 of those are pure basically. So then, just to try to summarize all of this, um, if you use, if you choose the isocratic separation, which is the traditional way of doing it, it in that example, we had to collect 22 fractions. Uh, we used nearly a liter of solvent, and it would take about 30 minutes if you knew what you were doing. Uh, in the step elution process, we could reduce the number of fractions to 15. We reduce the solvent a little bit and reduce the time a little bit. But the real gains come with the optimized gradient. So with that, uh, the time was similar to the step elution, about 16 minutes. We've only used 660 mils of solvent instead of nearly a liter. And we've and the time for the purification is nearer 20 minutes, not 30. So looking at an overview of a typical flash chromatography system, I've got one here. Um, we have uh, uh, this is actually our, our previous generation system, the RF, but they're all pretty much similar in the way they work. You've got solvents and some kind of solvent management system. You then have a, a pumping system, a gradient delivery pumping system. Then some way of introducing the sample, in this case a sample loading cartridge. An injection valve to be able to inject the sample or to be able to wash the column first. Then you've got a column holder which holds the separation column. Uh, and then in, after that, you've got an de integrated detector and fraction collector. And all of this is controlled by an integrated PC with touchscreen controller. As I've mentioned, there's been we've been making these systems since 1997. With the S of just showing set the history of the systems here. The SG100 was the first one that's on the left hand side. Then we've got the 100C. The companion was launched in 2002, the RF in 2007, and the next gen, I think, in 2018. So, so there's you know quite a history and uh, quite an evolution of these products in terms of their capability. 
So just focusing a little bit on the next gen now, as I said, they were launched in 2018. There are basically three types of next gen. We've got the 300, the 300 plus and the next gen system. Um, I'm just going to, just for the benefit of saving time, just touch on the 300 plus, which is the one with the most most features and benefits. Uh, the other two systems have, you know, slightly slightly reduced capability, but are still still very good in terms of what they can offer and in terms of value. So we have uh, software control via this 30 or 37 inch touchscreen and inbuilt computer. The, system, the reason the system is called the 300 is because it runs to 300 mils per minute and the minimum flow rate of one mil. Um, maximum pressure limit is now 20 bar. One of the, with typically with glass column chromatography, you're working at one or two bar. With these systems, because you're pumping, it's good to be able to go to higher pressures, uh, particularly with reverse phase chromatography, because that can help with the resolution. We have a, an injection valve there, which is a solid load injection valve. We use something called RFID rack and column reading. So they, the, the racks uh, and the columns can be identified when you put them in the system. And that just makes it easier because it automatically loads methods for you. The systems have a lot of safety features. They've got active solvent and waste level sensing and air purge. Um, if you're working in normal phase chromatography, you are working with flammable solvents. So uh, it, you need a lot of safety features. And also the idea of the system is to run unattended. So you want to be sure that the solvents are not going to overflow uh, or equally the solvents are not going to run out and cause any damage to your column. The systems can generate binary gradients and they can also add modifiers. Sometimes modifiers are needed if you're working with acidic or basic compounds where, where they can have some different interactions with the silica or the packing material which cause the separations to be not so good. We can use four solvents as well. And as I've mentioned, we work with, uh, we have an automated fraction collection system which is controlled by the detection. Uh, the system has to be simple to use. Um, it's and that's that's really the big the big reason why it's been adopted by so many people. Um, if you've got very complicated software and people don't use it very often, then it tends to stop people, put people off actually working with the system. So when you are working in the system, as I mentioned, it's touch screen. Uh, what you have is this uh, screen here. This is showing on the left hand side the absorbent scale um, for UV. Uh, it's actually you can collect in here, it would be collecting in 240 and 280 nanometers. The blue line is the proposed gradient from which is displayed over there on the right hand side from 0 to 100 percent. And at the bottom of the scale, you've got uh, time, or you can also have that displayed as column volumes, which is preferred by some and when you've set up your method and as I say it's all touchscreen you can press the start button to start your gradient um, and then you select down here peak, what you want to collect everything or just peaks that are identified by the detector um, and so it, yeah it's pretty simple so down here it says called 12 gram column and the solvents that we're using. When you have done a separation, you would end up with a report like this. Hopefully, hopefully nice, easy separation here. You've got the frac three different fractions here, which have been and these colored lines underneath the fractions indicate, uh, you know, where where the fractions are in, in relation in relation over here. You have a map of the fraction collector, so it's showing you where the fractions have been collected. So and you also the report contains a lot of information on the method and these are PDF reports so you can store them away or transfer them into your laboratory notebook. We have a, an automated sample injection valve to load your sample. Um, so this enables you to it's good to wash the column first, particularly with reverse phase to equilibrate the column. And then you have you can either load the sample by injecting it 
using a you know if the sample is soluble in the mobile phase that you're using sometimes the sample is not soluble in the mobile phase that you're using so uh, chemists would typically do what they call a solid injection where you mix the sample with silica and then dry it so you and effectively what you're doing is packing a pre-column with your sample already absorbed onto it and the pre-column in this picture is, is shown here it's not got any silica in it but it's this sort of column that's sitting here and this would actually sit on top of the valve here which sits on top of the separation column uh, the whole once you once you have inject set the system up and press run the injection process is really kind of automatic and then at the end of the run the system does a wash to make sure you don't have anything left behind for the next person using the system We've got uh, a pumping system which consists of uh, dual pumps, they're syringe pumps in this case. It's, it's a high pressure gradient formation, which means the gradient is delay is less than a low pressure system. The gradient accuracy is 1% and the pumps can pump from 0 to 100% very reproducibly. Um, and the real test for these pumps is pumping solvents such as methylene chloride or dichloromethane which are very dense um, pumping these at high flow rates and also typically the solvents might be on the floor underneath the machine and the machine is on the bench so this is a challenge for any pumping system which which these pumps work can cope with very well uh, also it's important to mention that the system works at high flow rates without making too much noise as I've mentioned, you could, the system works with four. You've got the option of four solvents, but it delivers a binary gradient. And then there's the option to have, add a third solvent as a modifier. This is useful because you don't have to premix the solvents before you start if you have issues with acidic or basic compounds. You can change those solvents at any time during the run. So you could start a gradient between solvent A and solvent B, and then later in the run change so that you're making a gradient between solvent B and solvent C, for example. As I say, you can choose any of the, any of the four solvents as two at a time and program in solvent changes, or you can make the changes in real time during the run. And as previously mentioned, the solvent monitor knows the solvent level that uh, so you should not run the column dry and you should never overfill a waste container. Um, the 300 systems can fit a column up to 330 gram in size, which is really a 10% loading would enable you to purify up to 33 grams of material. Uh, the, the optimal loading would be 1%, which you would use in a difficult separation. Uh, sometimes people want to do occasional separations on a larger column, and, and what's shown here on the picture is is the system sitting next to an adapter which is holding a larger column in this case a 1.5 kilogram column so that you can you know if you've got occasional separations where you want to purify larger amounts of material that is possible um safe there as i previously mentioned there are many safety features in the system we've got automatic level sensing a lot of anti-static tubing because uh, high flow rates and uh, non-polar solvents is a potential to generate static electricity, which you don't want. Uh, there's a pressure limit setting in there, vapor sensors to detect leaks. Um, and then what's shown on this picture is a fraction collector enclosure. So if you are working in an open lab, you can put this the option of this enclosure over the fraction so to reduce the amount of solvent vapour in the lab. There are a number of detection options. Uh, we've got UV, which is the most common, UV visible, integrated evaporative light scattering, and then we have uh, integrated mass spec as the, as the sort of ultimate option. And, and these detectors are available on all, all the systems. So if we look quickly at the UV, as I've mentioned, it's 200 to 400, 
or 200 to 800, it's actually a diode array detector. You can change the wavelength during a run. I mean, typically you know what wavelength you want to run at, but if you've made a mistake or something, you could change the wavelength. You, the, the most common option would people would choose would be to, to use two wavelengths to look for the compounds and then each of those wavelengths to trigger the fraction collector. We have an option called all wavelength triggered fraction collection, which basically averages together, averages wavelengths from the diode array to, to, to this way of scanning to see if there's any activity at another wavelength. I'll show you an example in a minute. And then we have another option called automated baseline correction. With some solvents working at certain wavelengths, you will have issues where um, as the gradient changes, the it will have an effect on the UV. So the, UV, the baseline of your run will be increasing or decreasing, which can make it harder to detect the compounds because the software is looking for slope changes. So we um, we basically have this baseline correction, which allows you to, to, to run and detect. For instance, with ethyl acetate, you could do a run at 220 nanometers, which is where ethyl acetate absorbs and then correct for the effect of the ethyl acetate and still see the peaks. And there are other features, purity indicators and purity ratios in the software. Looking at all wavelength detection as an option, uh, basically on this example here, you've got a red trace which is running this green tea extract um, and monitoring at 254 nanometers. And in this case, the green tea is not resolved, but you've got two compounds there shown on the red trace. The green trace is using this all wavelength feature where we have scanned across a range of wavelengths, say from 220 to 300, and averaged those wavelengths and produced this sort of composite trace. And by doing that, we've actually improved the sensitivity compared with 254 for, com for, for two of the peaks, but we've also identified a third peak, peak A, which you didn't see on the 254. Um, and the fraction collector has collected three fractions. So <coughs> Basically, by using the all wavelength, you've actually been able to, imp to, to collect more than you would have been able to do using 254. Evaporative light scattering detection is another kind of detection that's used in automated flash. Um, evaporative light scattering uh, basically doesn't rely on a chromophore, basically. So you uh, if your sample doesn't have a UV chromophore, then that's a limitation of UV detection. Evaporative light scattering basically involves the sample being sprayed or nebulized and sprayed into a, into a chamber, and then you basically heat or cool the chamber to evaporate the solvent. So that's the evaporation. And then you should be left with particles of sample that are being blown in nitrogen down past a detector. And as they pass through the detector, they scatter the light. So you have evaporation and light scattering. So they are, when they were launched, they were people were calling them universal detectors, but every kind of detection has some limitation. And the biggest limitation with evaporative light scattering is that the sample has to be less volatile than the mobile phase because you're relying on the mo the evaporation to get rid of the mobile phase but not get rid of the sample but there are certain samples this is very useful for typically polymers sugars carbohydrates steroids detergents these kind of samples often have a weak or or even no chromophore at all so it's very useful for those so it, just a quick example with evaporative light scattering we're showing a, a, a separation here with um Sugar. This is a sugar, which is a ribofuranose compound. Um, the red trace is the UV trace at uh, absorb absorbance. The green trace is the evaporative light scattering trace. Um, and you'll see that on the red trace, you've got two compounds, the second one at five minutes, but then nothing detected after that. The green trace is showing an ELSD peak, which there's one at three minutes, and then there is uh, one at nine minutes, which is actually the one that we're interested in. So basically, 
you would you know you would not be able to collect use the detector to to comp the UV detector to detect this compound. Uh, the LSD is very useful. Just quickly talking about mass spec, which is being integrated as an online system <coughs> in in all the flash and prep systems that we have. It's fully integrated into the software and basically gives you mass directed purification or compound verification and can work in conjunction with UV and ELSD. Uh, there's two models of mass spec. Uh, it's uh, there's a model S and a model L. The difference is the, the mass range that they, det they detect. The S is to detect up to 1200 Dalton. The model L is larger range, L for larger range, it detects up to 2000 Dalton. This is a single quadrupole mass spec, um, can work in positive or negative mode, and it has the option of electrospray or APCI as the sample introduction probe. Uh, you also have the option to use the mass spec to do direct injection. So people who have this also use it for maybe reaction monitoring, you know, as well as using it to identify the compounds that they have collected. So the benefit of uh, to having a mass spec is that you can determine the presence of a co-eluting impurity. Uh, you can choose you, you can choose up to six masses that you want to look for. Um, you can specifically set the detector to look for a specific mass and then terminate the purification after that mass is eluted. That potentially can save time and chain and save solvents and costs. Um, having the mass spec in the system can reduce the need for a lot of post purification analysis. You don't have to do so much TLC to identify the spots. You don't have to you do a lot of post run LCMS or to identify where the fractions are. Um, you because you're collecting specific masses, you don't have to collect peaks that are you can eliminate unwanted masses and and this kind of mass spec is very useful in natural product research when you're searching for specific compounds within a within a very complex mixture. Uh, just a quick application example looking at uh, this is to show uh, using what we call wide polarity range chromatography as a screening method to show how this can be useful with things like natural products and complex mixtures. So what you can do is use a range of mis miscible solvents to elute compounds off a column. So you can start with the weak solvent and then use a succession of stronger solvents to elute the compounds. If you remember, I said you could change the gradient. So, so you, in, if you have a complex mixture, you've got this would give you the best opportunity to elute the unknowns. Um, and also, you know, you can suggest which you'll know, look at which solvents to use depending on the polarity range. So these kind of methods are used by natural compound, natural product chemists to do screening um, and, and very useful with mass spec. So to have the mass spec as well. So just to show an example, uh, this is a, a capsicum or a, you know, basically a pep, chili pepper purification. Um, and what the customer did was to purify, was to try purifying this capsicum on a range of columns. And what I'm showing here is the attempted purification on an alumina column. So the gradient in this case, which is the, the line that's going up here, is a blue line from hexane to ethyl acetate. And then they're running a second gradient from ethyl acetate to methanol, and then running a third gradient from methanol to water. So the um, Cap, the capsicum peak seems to elute in the, at the end of the hexane ethyl acetate gradient, and that's been, that's the 306 compound. So you have got a peak there, but it's still showing a lot of impurities. So you're getting some purification, but not complete purification. Oops, sorry. Second, showing the same, attempted the same purification again, but this time on a C18 column. Um, the gradient, the gradient this time is in reverse phase. So you're starting with water, then moving to methanol, 
and then to dichloromethane. Um, what we're seeing this time is two compounds there which are eluting at the end of the first step. These two compounds here. <coughs> Uh, but they're not completely resolved from each other and they're not completely resolved from the impurities. Um, there are a number of other slides which I'm not showing, showing the same attempted separation on different columns, but it, those two were the best, the best two, the alumina column and the C18, but, but basically they both had some success, but neither was able to complete the purification on its own. So what you need to do is combine this together. So what the customer then did was run the capsicum purification on the alumina column, collect the fraction and then run a second purification on the C18 column just with that fraction. So it's a two step process. Now what we'd learn from the screen, the initial screening is that the active compound on the C18 column came out in the methanol water phase, so you didn't need to continue that reverse phase gradient into an into a third non-aqueous reverse phase uh, gradient. So the final purification here is this is with the in, initial purification on uh, alumina, and then in, re-inject the sample onto the C18 column, and what you've got here is is of your fraction, three different uh, capsicum compounds partially resolved from each other. So, and this mixture that you've then collected could be then uh, analyzed on a LCM, on a PrEP LC. So, that's just finishing off talking about flash chromatography. Uh, if you need to know more about that, this booklet is very useful. It, talk, it has a lot of information on flash and TLC and how to go from one to the other. Just talking now about preparative HPLC. Uh, why or when to use PrEP or what flash and then finishing off quickly on talking about the PrEP systems. So the goal when you're doing any separation is to purify a mixture of compounds. So the questions you would ask is how much crude material do you have? What's the relative concentration of the target compound that you compared to the mic crude mixture? How difficult is the separation? And what's the final purity required? Um, if you look at the makeup of a flash or a preparative HPLC system, they're basically the same. You've got solvents, pumps, sample introduction, column, detector, and then you've got some of your fraction collector. Uh, here and with the analytical system, maybe you have some different software, but fundamentally the systems are the same. The only difference is the pressure they work at and the resolution they give. So if you look at flash chromatography, typically it works at low pressure. The columns are lower efficient, lower efficiency compared with that with HPLC. That's their larger particle size because they work at lower pressures. Um, big advantage is that they're less expensive and potentially disposable. Uh, the focus and flash tends to be on purification and speed. And in flash, you can work at higher flow rates and you can load more sample. And typically flash is run in normal phase, although you can run flash in reverse phase or use different phases. HPLC, higher pressure, up to 600 bar. The columns are much more efficient, smaller particle size. The resolution is much better. They are, however, much more expensive. And the focus typically in PrEP tends to be on analysis and quantification. Uh, and the other guess kind of disadvantage of PrEP HPLC compared with flash is the um, fact that you have to run at lower flows and you have to typically load a lot less sample in PrEP. Uh, and PrEP is usually C18, but uh, reverse phase, but, but once again, it doesn't have to be. So if you look at the advantages of preparative HPLC, uh, higher resolving power, it's infrared information rich detection There's many different detection options and you've got a very wide range of stationary phase chemistries available. 
the advantages of flash chromatography uh, is speed in terms of purification of milligrams to grams of material. You can quickly remove the majority of impurities in one run. It's much cheaper to run than HPLC uh, in terms of the cost of the system, the amount of sample, the, the amount of sample you can load on a column and the cost of the column itself is, is much less expensive. Uh, method development time tends to be less with flash chromatography as well compared with PrEP. Uh, in conclusion, I'm not trying to make an argument for using one or the other. Basically, the, the, the real answer to the question is you should use, you can use one, the other, or a combination of both, depending what you're doing. So, uh, so typically, uh, you would use the high capacity of flash in terms of the amount of sample to remove the bulk of byproducts and other interferences. It may be that flash can give you the purity that you need because you don't sometimes need to have 90 or 100 percent purity. Once you have run the collet sample through the flash system, you've reduced the amount of material, uh, but increased the concentration of the compound of interest. And it's that semi-purified material that you could then inject onto a PrEP HPLC for the final purification. So just to quickly talk about the PrEP system, this is the AccuPrep 150. It has a similar, the software is very similar to the uh, flash system. If you can work our flash systems, you can work this system. Flow rate up to 150 mils a minute, touch screen, small footprint and all the detection options available. The software, as I say, is based on our PeakTrek software. It's common to all of our systems. The system uses the automatic RFID racks to identify the rat fraction racks you're using. It has the automated solvent and waste level sensing and can work with up to six solvent lines. It's a binary gradient system, but you have a choice of up to six solvents. The footprint is very small. Um, most labs these days have more equipment and less space. Specifications, as I mentioned, up to 150 mils a minute, 6,000 PSI or 400 bar pressure, uh, UV, UV vis, ELSD, mass spec, and then you, the system generates binary gradients uh, it, using high pressure mixing. Uh, and then you've got a range of different sample introduction options. So you know, quickly skip over that. So we have a range of automation. We've got you can inject the samples manually. We have uh, what we call a um, auto injector, which is a way of uh, repeat injecting samples. I'll talk about the automation in a minute. We have a column selection valve, uh, waste tube switching valve, so you can you can run multiple samples and put the waste of each sample into a different tube. We have a large volume sample load pump. This is for peptide samples typically, which are very tend to be very large and dilute. You can add modifier with a third solvent modifier pump, and then we have different rack options for large samples and various different rack sample introduction options or fraction collection options. Automation options, we have an auto injector, which is a, a way of injecting sample. Um, multi so basically you have the same sample that you want to inject multiple times. Uh, so you it's a way of, it's a single sample multiple injection system. An auto sampler would enable you to inject multiple samples. And there are two different sizes of auto sampler, which the, the four by two is pictured at the bottom here. This has four extra fraction collector racks and two racks for samples. We have a as well as so I'm not going to talk any more about the prep system just to finish off, uh, just to mention the hybrid system, which is our easy prep system. This is shown here. This is the uh, this is a combined flash and prep system. So you have the the software PC control collector and then you have a column loaded here for flash separations and then you have a second column and injector here for preparative separations. So you could perform flash and prep on the same system. 
So the flow rate up to 200 mils a minute, pressure up to 240 bar, which for, for prep or 13 bar for flash. Uh, choice of all the detectors as before. And this system automatically switches between flash and prep. So when you come to the system, you decide whether you want to do a flash separation or a prep separation. And it has valves inside which switch the flow which either to the low pressure side or the high pressure side. Um, and the automation options that are available for the prep system are also available for the prep injection on the easy prep. So you, you, we have the auto injector, the auto sampler as well. So conscious of the time uh, to summarize, we have a product family available for flash and preparative LC purification. All the systems are easy to use and use similar software. Uh, we have a range of detection options available and we have uh, automation available for preparative HPLC. Uh, there are multiple safety features which are very important for these kind of systems and the systems are small in size which is becoming increasingly important as our laboratories run out of space. Thank you very much for your time um, and uh, well if anybody has any questions I'll, I'll hand it back to Vince. Thank you, thank, thank you for that. Thanks. Um, does anybody uh, have any have questions? questions? Please feel free to use the dialog box or unmute your microphone. I see we have a question from uh, Asfa. Asfa, would, would you, uh, do you have a question perhaps? I'm not sure that we have any questions at this point. Um, okay. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Sorry we overran and the problems at the start. Philip, uh, thank you for presenting today. Uh, it was a, a really great presentation. Thank you. Uh, lots of information. Yes. Um, I think uh, I think most of our delegates uh, do have our contact details. So if there are any questions with regards to uh, the systems from Teledyne, um, please uh, feel free to reach out, uh, email the relevant rep at separations or myself, um, and we will gladly assist with uh, information as needed. Thank you.
Thanks, and you have the presentation if, to share if you if you need to. Thank you very much. Yes, no, we do have it. Thank you for the. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Uh, bye, everybody. Thank bye, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, then. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. bye.